It is my pleasure today to welcome people to um, the second workshop series given by the Agriculture Genome to Phenome uh, Initiative. Um, these workshops um, cover a variety of topics. Um, the current series is about um, informing non-biologists about the genotype to phenotype problem space, basically giving a crash course in a variety of biology going from basic cell molecular uh, biology all the way up through how those components give rise to what we call the phenotype. Um, this is workshop two, um, sorry, day two out of four. Um, so there's two more weeks. Um, today, we're gonna have um, two lectures. One of them is gonna be on genetics, alleles and linkage by Dr. Cliff Weil. And the second one is taking um, what we've now learned in terms of basic molecular biology and inheritance and how we start quantifying the activity of cells and organisms at multiple levels, mostly at the molecular level. And that will be given by Dr. Ryan Bartholomew and Dr. Julie Piauskowski. Uh, um, with that, sorry. <laughs> with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Cliff and to ask him to kick off on genetics alleles and linkages. All right. Thank you very much, Eric. Let me do the requisite screen sharing thing here. And go to present mode. And lest I run afoul of Nicole, caption mode. Perfect. All right. Can you all see the slides? Do you see the slides? Yes. Somebody? Yes. Good. Okay. All right, so uh, as Eric mentioned, what I'm going to talk today to you about uh, are about three things, but really what I want you to take home are two of them in particular, because one of them is not going to be especially newsworthy to you. But we need to go through that piece of non newsworthy part to get to, to where we need to go. So the, the main points to take home today are going to be this term allele. An allele, which you'll hear people bat around a lot, is really nothing more than the form of a gene, some form of a gene. So if a gene is a series of DNA letters all strung together, like we talked about last week, and I compare two of them and they have any differences at all, then they constitute two different alleles. Geneticists often use what we call mutant alleles, variations that differ from what you normally find out there in nature, to tell us something about a gene's function. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. The other major take home point is the part that's not gonna be news to most of you, which is that in organisms like yourselves with two copies of every chromosome, when you go to make either sperm or eggs, the chromosomes segregate from each other so that each gamete, each sperm or each egg, only has one copy of each of these things so that when sperm meets egg to form the new organism, it gets back to two. So this idea that each copy of a chromosome has one allele or another allele or sometimes the same allele of a particular gene, when you make a gamete, only one copy is going to go to each of those gametes and it's going to be very carefully divided so that uh, the two copies separate from each other, or what we call segregate from each other. And the real take home message today is going to be this last one, which is that landmarks on DNA or alleles, changes in DNA that are near one another, physically near one another on the same chromosome, are very likely to be inherited together because it'll be harder for anything to separate them away from each other. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. We call those things linked. And linkage between DNA landmarks and thing, changes in DNA that cause changes in phenotype are really the business end of what you'll be looking at mostly when you look at data. In contrast to that, landmarks that are on, on DNA that are located on two different chromosomes, you have 23 different chromosomes. So something on chromosome two versus something on chromosome three. Those things segregate independently from one another. They're inherited independently from one another. What happens to one of them really doesn't have much to say about what happens to the other. We call those things unlinked. So really what you're after when you look at data these days is to find linkage between things, usually because they're physically near one another on a chromosome. So you recall from last time that a gene is really just a sequence of DNA or RNA, and I've kind of shown that here down at the bottom. Uh, 
And that piece of DNA ultimately gets wrapped up into chromatin and then chromosomes, the familiar things that you're used to seeing in pictures and uh, in movies and that sort of thing. And the fact that these genes occur on chromosomes allows them to be packaged up and separated when cells divide, and in particular separated when cells go to form gametes. So as I mentioned to you uh, earlier, an allele is just a form of a gene. And really any difference at all, when this is usually DNA sequence changes we're talking about, any difference at all between two versions of a gene makes them two different alleles. So if you think about that for a second, if a gene is perhaps thousands of bases long and there are four different bases possible at each, each position, the number of possible alleles is staggering. There's huge numbers of different kinds of alleles. And some of those changes will impact whether or not the gene can function properly or the product of that gene can function properly. And if it cannot, sometimes that changes the phenotype, the outward appearance of the organism. And so, uh, for example, if a flower is typically purple and I mutate a gene, there's a change in the DNA sequence of a gene that turns that flower white, I can actually make some conclusions about that. The most important is that the gene that changed is involved in flower color. So I learned something about the gene's function by breaking it and seeing what changes. It's sort of a counterintuitive way to, to understand how things work, but it turns out to be very effective. And I've shown you a bunch of different examples here. So here are pictures from a, a plant called Arabidopsis, where a typical flower looks like this, where you see little petals and female parts and male parts. And there are mutants that get rid of all of those parts and end up replacing them with little leaves. And the gene that gets changed, you can then conclude is important for specifying make a flower here. Because if I break it, I don't make a flower. Similarly, there's a gene here called A gamus. And if I break it, I no longer make any of the sex parts, all I make are petals. And so I can reasonably conclude that that gene was important for specifying the sex parts of the flower. There are things that change the color of corn kernels. There are things that change the color of squirrels. I like this one because I used to have a black squirrel in my backyard. And interestingly, when the squirrels had babies, one year there would be a black squirrel running around and the next year there wouldn't. And the next year there would, and the next year there wouldn't. And that turns out to be exactly what Mendel found in his plants. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. But you can see lots of different genetic changes to the patterns on shells here, different changes to the coat color of rabbits. These are all different alleles of the very same gene resulting in very different results when it comes to what the rabbit looks like. So there's lots of different possible versions of genes and mutant alleles tell us about what genes functions are. So we often follow traits through several generations, watch how they're inherited through several generations of parents and offspring to let us know whether or not those traits are controlled by alleles of genes at all, or what we call heritable. There's a couple of examples in cartoon form here where, how many of you here can roll your tongue, right? Like that. It turns out that that's a genetic trait, all right? Some of you can, and some of you cannot. And if someone who can roll their tongue has children with someone who cannot, then it turns out that all of the children can roll their tongue, even though they got one gene from dad and one gene from mom. And that turns out to be something called dominance. And we're gonna talk about that again in just a second. Here. But it turns out that the, the chromosomes that went into making the eggs in mom and the sperm in dad, kind of cartooned over here, separated when they made those gametes, when they made those eggs and sperm. And the alleles that might have been on those two chromosomes also separate. So if in some cases, a parent has two different alleles on their two different chromosomes, one egg cell here, for example, will get either this chromosome or this chromosome. It will either get the alleles on this chromosome or the alleles on this chromosome, but it won't get both unless something horrible has happened. Usually it won't get both. So when information is passed from parent to offspring, if sex is involved, as it often is, then there is mixing of information from the two parents in forming the offspring. So the information in an egg cell is mixed together with the information in a sperm cell to create the zygote. 
Now, this is not news to most of you, I'm sure, but we need to understand that to get to where we have to go. So we often compare parents to offspring, and we often do that over several generations, and we do lots of counting of who gets uh, derived from whom. And it allows us to develop testable hypotheses about how information gets inherited. And those hypotheses and testing those hypotheses about how information gets inherited is what we call genetics. So it turns out that, as I said, in organisms that have two copies of each chromosome, like you, two different alleles of the same gene can be present in the same organism, right? At the same time, one on each of the two chromosomes, just like I showed you in this cartoon back here. Each gamete carries only one copy and the alleles segregate from one another when those gametes get made, the egg and the sperm get made. So Mendel, right, Gregor Mendel, the, the monk back in the 1800s, figured this all out by crossing plants together, counting the offspring from the things that he crossed, and then making models and statistical predictions. And the thing that Mendel did that nobody else before him had done were really two, there were two fundamental things he did differently. People at the time thought that genetics worked by blending. The same way if you blend red paint with white paint, you get pink paint. And that that's how genetic information got passed from parents to, to offspring. Mendel had noticed that that didn't work for some of the things that he was looking at in his garden. And so he decided to test his idea. And the two things he did differently was that he started by developing versions of his plants that were what were called pure breeding. So in this predic predic uh, particular example, he had plants that made yellow peas and he worked on it to the point where he had versions of pea plants that made only yellow peas. No matter what happened, they were always yellow. In contrast, he also had some that made only green peas and he worked on them until he made sure that they only made green peas. So he started with pure reagents. Mendel was a little bit of a chemist and so pure reagents were something he understood. He was also a bit of a statistician. And so he tried to apply statistical predictions to the things that he saw. And those two things turned out to be the most important. So what he did was to cross some of his varieties, and you've all probably seen this before at some point, but he crossed one of his pure yellow pea lines to one of his pure green pea lines. And what he noticed was that rather than blending, what he ended up with were things that were all yellow. And so this allowed him to conclude that this trait, this yellow trait was dominant over this green trait. In other words, if he put the two of them together, the yellow trait was what showed up, right? And so the terms became dominant and recessive. The dominant trait is whatever allele phenotypically masks the other allele's effect, the yellow masking the green. The recessive trait, that would be green here, is the allele that gets masked. So there's something that is doing the masking and something that's getting masked. Now we now know that it works something like what, what I've cartooned here, where if I have two versions of the gene that makes yellow, I end up with a yellow pea. If I have two versions of the gene that don't make yellow, I end up with a green pea. If I put the two of them together, and that's what happened here, one version from this parent, one version from this parent, so they're both together in this pea here, I end up with yellow. And the reason is that one allele is making something and the other allele is not. In this case, both alleles are making this enzyme that makes the, the P turn yellow. In this case, no allele is making that enzyme. And so the P is not yellow. But it turns out if I've got one copy that is making this enzyme and another that is not, all I need is the one that is. Somebody in the group is making the enzyme I need to turn the, the P yellow, right? So in this case, it's yellow. In this case, it's also yellow, but in this case, it's green. So Mendel picked not just the color of peas, but a bunch of different things. And we'll talk about them in a second, but he picked a bunch of different traits in his pea plants that showed this property. There were two discrete states. And whenever he crossed pure versions of the two things, one version was dominant, right? And so he, then had seven different places to test this idea that there were things that were in these two lines 
that segregated when they made gametes, that came together to make progeny, and that gave him the ability to make statistical predictions of that model. And the statistical prediction that he could make was that if we look over here, some factor, a gene, an allele of a gene, one from this parent, one from this parent, combined in this parent. And if he self-fertilized this plant, now this parent made types of gametes, just like these did. But in that case, half of them should be a capital Y shown here, and half of them should be a little y shown here. Half of them would specify the yellow trait, half of them would specify the green trait. And if he crossed these together, if that were true, if half of them were big Y and half of them were little Y, then statistically, he should see something like what's shown down here in the left, right? Half of them are big Y, half of them are little Y. The same is true for the, the, the female side and for the male side. And through that, he could make a statistical prediction, which is that a quarter of the time, half times a half, he should get two yellow versions of the gene together. A quarter of the time, he should get two green versions of the gene together. And two quarters of the time, or a half of the time, he should get one of each. And in that one of each case, just as he saw back here, those should also be yellow. So three out of the four possible combinations would be yellow. One of them would be green, or what everybody now calls a three to one segregation. And you might have run into this in classes before. He could make this statistical prediction for what would happen here. Well, it turns out he looked at, as I said, seven different traits that had this characteristic of being dominant. There was one version that was dominant when he put them together, and there were only two states that he saw. And it turns out that in every single one of these cases, when he did the same experiment that I just described for you for the yellow and the green, he got exactly what he predicted within a statistical uh, certainty. So the ratios weren't precisely three to one, but they were pretty close. Now, it turns out that he probably had a little bias when he was scoring. People like to say that Mendel cheated. It wasn't really cheating so much as just saying, you know, if this is what I predict, and I'm not really sure if this P is really round or wrinkled, but if I call it wrinkled, it fits my data a little better. I'm just gonna call that one wrinkled. So there was a little bias in what he did, but it doesn't change the net result, which is that all of these different things validated his hypothesis. Now it turns out that even if the phenotypes aren't as convenient as the one that, ones that Mendel looked at, the genotypes, the genetic underpinning for things still follows the same rules that Mendel described. And so here's the thing I showed you a minute ago with the peas, but let's imagine a DNA change. Here's a string of DNA. Here's another, this is one chromosome, this is the other. There's a DNA difference right here where this little explosion happened. And it changes whatever the allele is over here from whatever the allele was over here. We're gonna call this one big A, and we're gonna call this one little a, just to be something different. And we're gonna say that that difference in DNA introduced a site where an enzyme can cut the DNA and the details of it aren't important. The trick here is that if I have these two pieces of DNA and I isolate them and I cut them with the enzyme whose site was here, I've now introduced the ability to cut this here. And instead of one big piece of DNA, that enzyme will now cut this same piece into two pieces of DNA. And I can see the difference if I run that out on a gel. And again, the details here don't matter. But what I want you to understand is that I can actually see all of the cases here rather than having something be dominant and something be recessive. So if I only have a version of the DNA where there is no ability to cut here, one big piece, then all I see if I cut this DNA and run it out on a gel is one big piece. I'm separating things by size here. In this case, sorry, let's go over here. In this case, I cut both pieces into two smaller pieces and I see those two smaller pieces on a gel. But if I have one of each, kind of the same way Mendel saw in these yellow peas where something was dominant, 
I see both of these. I see one long piece and I see two short pieces. And you can see that here. So the way these things segregate in a cross allows me to see all of the possible uh, phenotypes here rather than just seeing three yellow and one green. The point I need you to understand here is that DNA a lot of times is what is looked at now. Phenotypes get looked at to some extent, but a lot of the data that you'll see are oftentimes just DNA sequences. And the good news is that you can see any change in the DNA, even if there are two present at the same place at the same time. So two different versions of the same gene. All right. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. If it is, then we can have, we can talk about it later. All right, so it turns out that these things that Mendel was following around in his crosses were genes on chromosomes. He didn't know that at the time. He just called them factors, made these statistical predictions. But it turns out that a few years later, people realized that all of the things that Mendel was predicting and describing in his peas it was also what people could see once they had microscopes that were good enough to see chromosomes. And so when you look at the way that gametes get formed in, in the process of meiosis, it's a cell division process in which the chromosomes first find each other and line up with their mates. So you have 23 chromosomes, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. When you perform meiosis to make sperm or to make eggs, all of the chromosome ones find each other and pair up. All of the chromosome twos find each other and pair up three, four, five, et cetera. That's the first thing that happens. So that the next thing that can happen is that one of those chromosome ones can go in one direction and the other can go in the other direction. And that's the segregation of the alleles that Mendel saw described at the molecular level. And that's true of all of the chromosomes that you have. The first thing that happens is that all 23 pairs find each other and line up and nothing happens until that's complete. So it's very important that all the pairs find each other and be able to segregate properly. Now, it turns out that that particular trick of finding each other, lining up and, and, and pairing so that they can segregate properly occurs with a little bit of a twist. And so what happens is that each pair of chromosomes kind of shake hand, shakes hands. Each arm of the chromosome physically exchanges a piece with its mate so that it can hang on in all of this traffic jam that's going on at meiosis. And that's gonna turn out to be important. We know that because we had to study what happens when that doesn't happen first. And so what happens if I'm looking at two different chromosomes here, we're gonna call one yellow and one blue over here or purple, I guess, and one brown and one blue. And you'll notice that there are alleles of genes, and we just called them A and B here, one on one chromosome, one on the other. In this other parent, there are two different alleles of A and B. And so when gametes get made, each gamete gets one copy of the two chromosomes here, one copy of the two chromosomes here. Now, it turns out these are both the same, these are both the same. So there's only one kind of gamete that can get made here. And when these two gametes come together to make offspring, the offspring now has two, chrom two copies of every chromosome again. But in this case, it's got one copy of each allele. So it has one copy of each of these chromosomes, one copy of each allele. The same is true for this chromosome, all right? Now, what's going to happen when this organism goes to make gametes. What's gonna happen is that all of these combinations are going to go into those gametes when these chromosomes segregate from each other. A will separate from, big A will separate from little a, big B will separate from little b. One copy of A and one copy of B will go into each gamete. But whether a gamete gets a big A and a big B or a big A and a little b, is completely independent, right? It's just as likely that it will get a big A and a big B as it is a big A and a little b. It is just as likely as a little A and a big B, just as likely as a little A and a little b. All of the things that happen here 
to this chromosome and to this chromosome are independent of one another, All right? And so at the end of the day, a quarter of the gametes that come from this thing will be each of the possible combinations. We call those things unlinked because what happens to A is unlinked to what happens to B. Whatever happens to A has no bearing on what happens to B. It's because they're on different chromosomes. And even though these line up together at meiosis and these line up together at meiosis, whether this allele separates to the top of the picture or to the bottom of the picture is independent of whether this big B separates to the top of the picture or to the bottom of the picture, right? The important thing to note is that the two things are independent from one, each other, one another or are unlinked. And we're not gonna really worry about the rest of these things over here, although you could ask about them later if you like. It turns out that alleles of two different genes that are located near one another on the same chromosome don't split up that way. They tend to be inherited together, or we say they're linked to one another. So in this case, right, if all of A and the A's and the B's are on the same chromosome, unlike they were over here, then what happens to big A is actually going to matter when it comes to what happens to big B. They are going to travel together. They're on the same piece of DNA, right? They don't line up independently of each other and they don't separate independently of each other. So we call these things linked. And we can tell they're linked because this rule of a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter is violated. It turns out that big A and big B show up together in more than their appropriate one quarter of the gametes. And different, different combinations, for example, big A and little b, show up less than their appropriate one quarter of the time. And so we call these things linked and it's because they're physically hooked together. And the closer they are, the more that's gonna happen. And we're gonna talk about that here in a second. So you'll remember I told you that pairs of chromosomes find each other, line up, pair, shake hands. They physically exchange a little piece of DNA. That's important for them to find each other and stay together while everybody else is finding their mate. Well, it turns out that if two things are physically close together, the chance that that little exchange is going to happen in between them and separate them is very small. And the closer they are, the smaller that chance. Now, it turns out that it might happen between two things that are physically a little more far apart. And what you'll see here is that B and C here are a little farther apart than A and B. And the exchange, the handshake that took place between these chromosomes took place in between B and C and split big B and big C up from one another. It's called a recombination event. But the closer two things are, the less that's gonna happen. And if two things are physically, literally right next to each other, it can't happen at all. So the closer you get, the less likely you are to be separated from something uh, that you're linked to. That turns out to matter. Because it turns out that if we look at DNA sequence, a single DNA, a single base DNA sequence difference between two organisms or what's called a single nucleotide polymorphism, often referred to as a SNP because we like acronyms. It turns out that a DNA change like this can be linked to another DNA change, not this one, but one just a little ways away from it, that turns out to be important for causing a phenotype. So let's go back to yellow and green peas for a second. I might not know the precise DNA change that changed yellow to green, that made that yellow gene unable to make its enzyme anymore so that the pea ended up green. But I might know about a DNA change that is very close to it, so close that it can't be separated when these two things get inherited together. And so if I know something about this DNA change, I don't have to know about the one that changed things from yellow to green, I can just follow something that's so close to it that it almost serves as a proxy, as a substitute. Now, it turns out that's really useful because I can evaluate whether or not there is a, a SNP, a single nucleotide change here, 
And I can evaluate whether that single nucleotide change is present in large populations of things just by getting a bunch of them, pooling all their DNA together, sequencing it, and asking at this particular place, is there an A or is there a G? And if I look at all the things I got the DNA from, are they all yellow peas or are they all green peas? And what's the statistical probability that an A at this position is present in a plant that had yellow peas? What's the statistical probability that a G is present in a plant that had yellow peas? What's the statistical probability of an A in green peas? What's the statistical probability of a G in green peas? And I can ask this for every place I can see a DNA difference. And what turns out to happen is that the larger the population you look at, the more convincing these things called associations become. All right, so what, who cares? Well, it turns out that if I compare two groups of things, we've been talking about yellow peas and green peas, but they can be sick patients and well patients. If I compare two groups of people, I can look at the probability that a single nucleotide polymorphism, and I can look at tens or even hundreds of thousands in these organisms, what's the chance that a particular base occurs at a particular position in the genome more often than is statistically predicted by chance in just the sick patients, but not in the, in the, in the unsick, in the healthy patients. And it turns out that the vast majority of these single nucleotide polymorphisms segregate independently, are unlinked, like we talked about a second ago, to the disease that causes these people so much trouble. But it turns out that a few of them are statistically present in these sick patients far more often than you would predict by chance and are absent in these control patients far more often than you would predict by chance. And that gives us an association between that position in the DNA and the cause of this disease. And that kind of thing gets mapped in a graph here where you're looking at the negative log of the probability that this particular SNP at this particular place on a chromosome is present in these cases just by chance. So the less likely it is that it's just an accident, the higher up you get on this graph. Now, you can find these, and this is the last slide, I think, for a couple of different reasons. One is the really, the, the holy grail of possibilities, which is that the DNA polymorphism, the SNP that you're looking at, is in fact the very thing that causes those people to be sick, or causes those peas to be green, or causes that horse to have a particular uh, coat color. In that case, it's great, because whatever you're following really is the cause of the phenotype. It also turns out that, as I mentioned to you before about linkage, the SNP that you're following isn't the cause, but it's really close to the cause. It's physically very close. And it's so close that this correlation is really statistically significant. And so what that does is allow me to narrow down my search for whatever is causing the phenotype to the region out of all of the genome, the region around this particular SNP or the things that are close to this particular SNP. And it turns out there are a few accidental versions of why this can happen around populations that you get your samples from. That's a little more complex. We don't have time to go into it. Uh, you might hear a little bit about that later in, the, in the, these workshops. Uh, if you don't, then feel free to ask me. I'll be happy to talk to you. about that. All right, so we talked about alleles. We talked about mutant alleles and how they can tell us about genes functions. And we talked about linkage. And those are the things that I really want you to take away from this. Now, when we break up into discussion groups, these are the questions that I want you to think about. We'll talk about the question, do all alleles impact a phenotype? Why or why not? I'll ask you to think about this. There's an, imagine an enzyme, we'll call it a gene Samoalis. And Samoalis means that you can't taste Girl Scout cookies, sort of like not being able to roll your tongue. Would you predict that a mutation that doesn't make this enzyme, would that be dominant? or would that be recessive? Why or why not? And how would you test that? And the last question I want you to think about are these sorts of associations we talked about at the very end. You'll remember I showed you pictures where there were all these little groups of points. And the ones that looked like they mattered 
occur in these piles of points. They're not just random points, they're stacks of points. Why do you think that is? All right, so that's the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing if I can find the thing that lets me stop sharing. There it is. And Ryan or Nicole, are you the ones that are dispersing people to groups? All right, is everybody back? I guess you are. Let's take a look at the answers. Do all alleles impact phenotypes? Why or why not? Breakout room one didn't think so. Why not? Who wants to, to chime in there? Somebody from breakout room one? You can have a silent mutation. Okay, fair enough. Breakout room two, also thought not. Allele's impact on phenotype is completely dependent on how it is paired and the nature of the traits inheritance, whether it's recessive or dominant. Hmm. So if something is recessive or dominant, let's see, uh, who's, who's gonna represent breakout room two? I need to ask you a question about that. I'm so happy to nominate someone. I picked Samuel. Samuel, okay. I Where's Samuel? That. Yes. <laughs> Samuel, there you are. All right, congratulations. You've been volunteered. Um, so if an allele is recessive, would it affect the phenotype? It would not, no. So you sure about that? What happened to the green peas? Yeah, I, I would say I'm from breakout room too. Mm -hmm. I think all, for me, the answer would have been yes, but just that it, we felt it depends on how it's paired. A recessive paired with recessive, it's going to express the phenotype. A right. recessive with the dominant, then probably dominant is going to express the phenotype. So each allele does play a role, but it it expresses as a phenotype or not depends on how it's paired. That's true, but what about, remember I said alleles are just forms of genes. Any sequence change makes you a different allele. Do all sequence changes impact the ability of a gene to function? He said leadingly. <laughs> Probably Samuel, not. I'm going to put you back on the spot. No, not necessarily. All right. Not necessarily. No. Right. So there are some alleles where you might change the DNA sequence and not change the protein sequence at all. It's a different allele. Absolutely. But no, no impact on the, on the phenotype or the function whatsoever. They so, think that there's 500 or more mutations every time a parent passes chromosomes on to a, uh, an offspring. So... We, we don't see lots of phenotypic changes from parent to offspring. All right. So everybody else seemed to decide the answer was no. And I think we've pretty much covered a good, good sampling of the answer. So let's go to question two. The great Girl Scout question. All right, so you have an enzyme, a gene that makes an enzyme, the Samoalis gene. If you don't have, if you have an allele that doesn't make this enzyme, and that's all you have, you can't taste those cookies. Do you expect that allele, that mutation, to be dominant or recessive? Room number one said it's expected to be recessive because if an allele to make the enzyme is present, they'll be able to taste the cookies, right? So if you have one of each kind of allele, one that makes the enzyme and one that doesn't, then overall the organism makes the enzyme and can taste the cookies. We picked on breakout room two already, let's go pick on breakout room three. Since it's caused by lacking the enzyme, we need two copies of the alleles to be able to see the lack of tasting. Although I like Thin Mints better. Well. That's a whole other story, but 
So talk about that a little bit. Let's have a representative from breakout room three. I nominate Selka. Good thing you have a, a roster of who was in which one. Selka. Selka's hiding. Then it's Charlene. Yeah, how about Charlene? Hi, I can talk about this. Um, okay. So we said, this is on question two, right? Question oh. two, correct. Okay, because I'm looking at question three, I'm sorry. No but we were talking about since there's the phenotype is only observed if there would be two copies of this gene present because it's the state of lacking the enzyme instead mm -hmm. of the presence of a novel enzyme. Mm -hmm. And so that requires the two copies, which behaves like a recessive. If That's someone true. had one copy of this and then a normal copy coding for enzymes, it would show phenotypically the dominance because it would phenotypically have the trait of having the enzyme, so sorry. Good, nope, that's, that's a good answer. That's a good answer and that's, that's correct. And it turns out that I think the ability to like thin mints is probably dominant because everybody seems to like thin mints. I don't know, I've heard some people say that they taste like toothpaste. Uh, there are, but. Don't make that's Charlene, right. don't make Charlene uh, uh, justify that. I added that at the end. So. You added that at the end, okay. <laughs> All right, so let's, since we're running out of time here, let's uh, jump down to question three. Why do you think peaks in association studies are usually those little piles of points rather than just single points? And so let's go pick on breakout room number four to start with this time. Mm -hmm. Somebody from breakout room four. Um, we were of the opinion that it's something to do with uh, linkage disequilibrium. There's multiple SNPs that are potentially associated with a uh, a uh, single SNP is actually the causative um, trait uh, SNP. So uh, especially if it's a very big gene, there's going to be lots of potential uh, SNPs nearby that get moved along with it when there's a crossover. Yep, that's a, that's a, a good explanation of it. So yep, yep. <laughs> some music going on there too. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a good answer. So if there's something that causes a phenotype, and there's a SNP that is nearby, there are also lots of other SNPs that are nearby as well. And so all of them are going to look like they are associated with that trait. The farther away you get from the thing that causes the trait, the less the association will be. And that's why there's a, a, a whole range of probabilities. The ones that are the closest will be the ones that are most likely to be associated. The ones that are a little farther away will be a little less the ones a little farther away than that, a little less until finally you get to ones that are so far away, they seem to be unassociated at all. So good answers. All right, good. Well, everybody did very well. Hopefully you got out of this, those three things, or the, those at least two things, that alleles are different forms of genes, that there are lots of different alleles, and that things that are linked tend to be inherited together. And you can use things that are linked to follow other things around. We'll need that information as we go into the rest of the workshop. So with that, I will relinquish the reins to Ryan and Chris. Do we wanna take a break for a minute or just keep going? Yeah, let's take a break for about five minutes or so. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Okay. Um, so I just want to give a quick recap of uh, what we've learned so far before we delve into more of the quantitative and mathematical and statistical side of, of uh, genotypes to phenotypes. Um, so, so far we've covered Mendelian inheritance, the central dogma and genetic linkage. But how can we use these principles in like a quantitative manner? Um, and with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Julia Piaskowski, who is a quantitative geneticist um, at the University of Idaho. Just switching the screens over. Same screen, just different person. <laughs> 
Hi, yes, I am Julie Piaskowski. I'm at the University of Idaho. Um, I'm a consulting statistician and my training was previously in plant genetics. So this is my bread and butter here. There we go. Um, so the answer is, you know, yes, of course. Um, you know, we can use principles to, um, on, you know, we can use these principles of genetic inheritance to understand how quantitative traits are um, inherited and passed and controlled by um, the alleles um, in, um, in, in individuals' gene, um, genome. Um, I want to highlight what quantitative traits can look like. So, of course, they're um, phenotypic traits that we can observe that have a quantitative distribution um, or maybe an underlying quantitative distribution that's a little harder to observe. And so it's thought to be controlled by many loci across the genome. And these can take the effect, or these can take the model of many loci, each having a small effect. And that's what this top graph looks like. And that could say be disease instance across the population or crop yield or milk yield in cattle are all classic examples. Um, or we can also look at um, many loci each, um, or we, or we can look at a few loci of large effects and then some loci of small effects. Um, and so that's what's going down in the bottom one where plant height can still um, have a lot of variation, but it tends to group based on if a dwarfing gene is present um, in it. So, um, we can describe this variation, break it down into different components. It's typically, you know, the old nature versus nurture is a really oversimplification of what's going on. There's, there's often many um, sources of variation contributing to observed phenotypic variation. So this is a really common formulation in egg. You've got phenotypic variance, um, which is the cumulative result of genetic variance, environmental variance, a genotype by environmental variance um, um, interaction term, and then error, which is, well, everything that we just quite didn't know what to do with. And um, so this would say be a theoretical distribution of progeny from across um, be between parent one and parent two, and we'd expect it to you know, look all over the place. And looking at this, it's hard to tell, like, the alleles contributing to this effect. Well, first of all, how much of this effect is genetic? We don't know. And are the alleles acting in an additive fashion or in a dominance and recessive fashion? In general, um, these sorts of models assume that um, an, an additive model, that both the alleles work in an additive fashion and the loci across the genome work in, in, an, in an additive fashion, I meaning you can just simply sum the effects. And then um, Dr. Wheel brought the term of heritability, I believe, and I'll also talk about it, but that is this ratio of the genetic variance over the total observable phenotypic variance. So can we relate genotypic information to phenotypic in, in, information and why would we want to? So, of course, the answer to question one is yes. That's why we have this whole series going on. And for answer number two, um, or for question number two, being able to understand how um, genetics and the environment contribute to, you know, observe phenotypic variation is the ultimate goal of genetics. Um, it's just so we can understand what goes on and manipulate genetics to our benefit. So, preventing disease, preventing premature death from disease, you know, increasing crop yields, increasing um, milk yields and CAD, all these, these are all classic examples. So it was said last time, and I'll just reiterate that we can use DNA markers, you know, markers located on the genome. So this is a, you know, a representation of a of a chromosome here with the gray and then the red is the um, centromere. And we can use DNA markers as proxies for what are actually causative alleles. Most of the time, the markers we can observe are not causative alleles. 
Um, and the assumption with how to relate, you know, genetic and phenotypic information is that, of course, genes, transcription factors, and any other genetic factors that control quantitative traits can be mapped to an individual's genome or to a population's, you know, collection of genomes. Um, and that the alleles that actually impact quantitative um, trait expression, um, which are what we call quantitative trait loci or QTL, can be um, at least statistically associated with DNA markers and possibly locate close to them on the genome. And then assuming that both um, quantitative um, trait loci, these causative alleles, and um, varying DNA markers are present and varying in a population, then we can estimate the association um, between them by looking at both the trait variation and marker segregation across a population. So the goal of so many genetic studies is find all the quantitative trait loci. Well, what is that? Um, it's first off, you know, an actual physical region on a chromosome influencing a quantitative trait. And so hopefully, you know, we'll have some flanking markers, you know, here's marker one, mark, 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 marker two, located some distance from a possible causative QTL. Um, but this QTL, when it comes down to it, is really just a statistical association between a quantitative trait and the chromosomal region. And hopefully we'll have genetic markers or DNA-based markers to help us detect that. So um, working with DNA markers is um, really handy for doing any genetic analysis because number one, they're pretty cheap to gather and they're just getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as time goes on. And um, some of the technical methodology is refined. Um, they're not influenced by the environment, which is, of course, always an issue with any quantitative trait you look at. It's evaluated, you know, in a field experiment or some other circumstances, and there's always going to be environmental influences, which make looking at the phenotypic trait really challenging. Um, some of the problems, though, is, is that um, when DNA markers are discovered, it can be difficult to use those markers in other populations or even in other, like, research programs or nowadays on other um, platforms that can be used to um, generate and detect DNA-based markers. Um, lots of crop species don't have many markers developed for them. It takes money and effort to do that, and there's lots of crops that fall under the category orphan crops. And I'm sure it's the same with um, agricultural animals um, um, as well. And regardless, um, um, high quality phenotypic data is nevertheless essential um, that can never be skipped over. And it is very expensive to gather. Um, so again, Dr. Villa um, um, introduced SNPs, um, single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, it's, a, it's an extremely common DNA um, marker type. It's the main one used, and it's just literally a single variation in a base pair. You know, across at least two individuals, um, although usually it's varying in a much larger population. It's not just one individual that's different. Um, they always have two alleles, um, just only two alleles, a major and a minor allele. And so we end up with three possible com com um, combinations, the um, homozygote for the minor allele, um, the homozygote for the major allele, and then the, he and the heterozygote between them. And that is sometimes referred to as a genotype. So how are SNPs actually detected, you know, in, in an individual or, a, you know, a, a composite in, of individuals? It's often by using existing SNP chips or um, SNP arrays. Um, many institutions um, or many companies have built these. You know, it's just a an array of thousands or millions of SNPs that were discovered in another in another um, population. Um, these are really easy to use. They're definitely on the cheaper side. Um, it may not work well with your population um, because the original reference population used to build that SNP chip is 
different. And so this is particularly um, seen when working with um, wild germplasm. I ran into this working with um, um, wild cherry that the SNP chip developed for domesticated cherry uh, transferred a little bit, but not fully. You know, a lot of these, um, what should be single nucleotide polymorphisms were actually single nucleotide monomorphisms. They weren't actually varying. Um, and then this is actual output um, when running a SNP array. It's actually, um, there's a fluorescence re re reaction that's used. And then each of these dots represents an individual and how that, you know, how that individual fluoresced at this particular um, SNP. And so um, sometimes it can be, they fall into these nice even groups where you can easily, you know, the dark area is the area where it's called, you know, so these were all called as, a, as AA. And then outside of that, um, they, these weren't called. And, and so um, the more different your population is from the reference population, the worse this arrangement becomes and the harder the call rate becomes. <clears throat> so, you can make your own SNP array. Um, so there is so much unsaid in this slide. Each step shown here is a massive amount of work. Um, to make your own SNP array is a year's worth of work and a publication. But SNPs are subject to you know, what's called assertion bias, which means the original population where the SNPs were developed can really influence you know, what, how you're able to interpret the downstream results. You know, so you run a SNP array on a new population and you're trying to interpret that population's genetic structure and its genetic diversity and its, nat and its natural history. And if that SNP array is a bad fit, then it's, you know, those conclusions are gonna go badly as well. Okay, but say you, regardless of all this, you still have a collection of SNPs for a, population, you know, that's again an assemblage of individuals. One thing we can do is use a technique called linkage mapping to track those quantitative traits and look at these marker trait uh, so associations. Linkage mapping uses um, actual linkage on, on chromosomes and how that linkage is broken up as a result of meiosis and uses that to determine the order in relative genetic distance of DNA markers on a chromosome and across a gene genome, and also uses that to um, detect the presence of possible QTL, or what we call putative QTL. And all this relies on the recombination frequency that occurs during meiosis, and that's what we can observe between two DNA markers. And that is, you know, as it sounds, the frequency in which there's a crossover between say loci A and loci B. Um, and this is, you know, of course, you know, cartoon representation of what happens during chromosome pairing. But when the recombination frequency happens every single time and A and B are essentially what we call unlinked and follow, you know, all of Mendel's laws of independent assortment and segregation. Um, still the recombination frequency can only be 0.5. And that's because of these other two chromosomes here. You know, they don't pair, they don't cross over. They're just parental types that are carried on and independently sort. And so, and so that's just a lesson that you'll always, you know, in progeny, always recover parental um, chromosomal arrangements as well as, um, um, as, as well as these recombinants. So we usually can't observe the actual Q on QTL. The best we can do is observe its nearest DNA markers. So again, here's you know, the representation of a chromosome where there's two SNPs and a Q of Q QTL in there. Well, we can observe this R, this recombination frequency, and then we use um, information on trait variation, on actual quantity of trait to try and infer this R1 and R2, you know, how close is this putative QTL located to this SNP or its um, other SNP? And the more high density of DNA markers you have for the genome, the better that goes. You know, so of course, again, the goal is to determine where's the chromosomal region where the QTL are likely located. I need to D on it. <clears throat> 
So this is an example cross. This is exactly, um, I worked with wheat for um, many, many years. Um, and this is a exact type of cross that we would have seen where you have one parental type that has all major alleles and another parental type that has all minor alleles. Um, and this is gonna produce the same gametes, um, you know, because it's fully homozygous and so and so will this one. And so the gametes will be um, AB and then um, AB, and those will be the ones that combine in equal pr proportions. And so the progeny, which we call um, F1, the filial generation one, will all look like this. It will be a mixture of these parental um, uh, genotypes, big A, little A, big B, little B. Well, because it's wheat, we can literally cross it with itself. It's called selfing. Um, of course, wheat doesn't produce sperm, but it does produce pollen. And then these are the different gametes that are produced. Um, these parental types, um, all, um, home, um, you know, these are basically all home, um, not homozygous, but you know, all major alleles, all minor alleles, and then these are um, mixed. And we would expect um, if, and then these are the proportions of the gametes we would expect to observe. And then these proportions need to sum to one. Well, if they were unlinked, then R is 0.5. And then, you know, then each of these ends up being point, you know, we get each of these gametes in, in equal proportions, 0.25. And when they are linked, then R is something different than 0.5. It's something less than that. Um, and then that's when we can track how close these alleles actually are. Um, of course, we can't actually observe gametes. All we can observe is um, what the um, progeny look, look like. So these were the gametic fre frequencies, 0.05, 1 minus R. Here are the frequencies of, of the individuals. And again, these all, um, this number all sums to one, like these are prob um, probabilities. And we basically use the observed genotypic frequencies to infer what this R is. And then we do that for, <laughs> So many markers, you know, just hundreds, thousands, you know, millions. Um, and that's about all I can actually say about QTL detection. The math is um, somewhat complicated, um, but very elegant. Um, you know, but the steps are in general that you create a population that has the sufficient genetic variation for your quantitative trait. That sounds obvious, but we've definitely seen populations where that um, <laughs> turned out to not be segregating and what a waste of effort. Um, trait molecular marker data are gathered on that. That's used to create the linkage map. That's the, you know, the order of markers, you know, into linkage groups. The linkage group is typically a chromosome. Map the, you know, possible QTL and then confirm those in, in, in a new population. So linkage mapping, it used to be the only way things were done. That's not the case anymore. It has some limits. Um, it relies on phenotypic data that can be, you know, very influenced by non-genetic sources of variation. And this can create a lot of pro um, problems. In particular, the QTL by environment it, it, it interaction is huge. Um, it requires a map of sufficient density to detect really good asso associations with any kind of genetic mapping, you can see, you know, spurious associations. They aren't real. They just appear to be there between a chromosomal region and trait. The results sometimes only go back to the family that was built, <laughs> that was used in the mapping pop on populations. And then sometimes there's just not enough opportunities for recombination. Like, you know, you need many events of recombination to get at what is that recombination frequency and maybe it's just too small of a sample size. And then the biggest drawback, which is what led to G loss, is the missing hair um, heritability. The QTL mapping is really good for finding large effect QTL, but when you have, you know, a, a trait that's influenced by many, many, many loci, each of small effect, um, or the alleles of small effect, then QTL mapping is not so great at that. So we'll go to GWAS, genome-wide association mapping, where we have this classic Manhattan plot is what was shown in the last talk. Um, 
so the difference between GWAS and this linkage-based QTL um, analysis is that, well, of course, the goal is the same. Let's find the loci. Let's find all the QTL linked to phenotypic traits. It's based on something called linkage disequilibrium rather than recombination frequency. You know, it's a population-based analysis, but rather than having a clear family structure from basically a planned mating, so something that happens in crop plants and in like agricultural animals, but would not happen in human population, of course. It relies on just assumed um, ancestral connections due to, you know, many, many, many meiotic, you know, rounds of meiosis over history. I mean, you get some really high um, re um, re um, resolution across the gene genome, but you need a very high density of SNP markers. So it relies on something li called linkage disequilibrium. It's the non-random association of alleles at different loci. Um, so if you had, say, you know, a population of individuals, again, two loci, you could have a major or minor allele. Um, you have both um, the frequency of those alleles, and that's across the population. And, and then you have the, um, and then you compare that to the frequency of the observable of the of the gametes. And so um, the frequency of each alleles will, um, you know, of the allele frequencies will sum to one. You know, th th these are probabilities that, you know, range between zero and one. And then the gametic frequencies are also going to sum to one. And disequilibrium can be measured by just looking at the difference in gametic frequencies over the difference in, it, in the allelic frequencies for that particular gametic com combination. So this can range from, as it says here, negative 2.5 to positive um, 0.25. Um, and then there's a conversion um, to make it more analogous to the coefficient of correlation that we're all that we're all familiar with that ranges from zero to one. You know, and zero means um, a zero D or R squared means there's no linkage disequilibrium. There actually are any, an equilibrium. The closer it gets to one, the higher the disequilibrium. And then this can decline um, over, you know, it, it's, you know, as it says, it says here, it's a function of all sorts of evolutionary forces like drift and random mating declines over many gen, um, generations. And that's really based on the recombination free frequency. That's what C is, so that stands for um, crossover free frequencies. So C equals 0.5, that's our unlinked genes. Well, it's there's still pretty high linkage disequilibrium in early gen generations, but the more generations, that's rounds of meiosis that go on, it quickly declines. Whereas tightly linked genes where there's very infrequent crossovers, um, it, LD is going to be very slow to decay. So coming back to GWAS, again, we're just assuming that DNA markers in the causative loci are in LD with one another. It's a really straightforward analysis, or at least um, there's many different formulations of, of it, but this one's pretty straight, straight forward. Um, we call this um, a linear mixed model um, where um, this y equals xb is actually um, uh, the standard y equals mx plus b that um, you, know, you may have learned in junior high. Y is the trait. Um, X is a design matrix for um, fixed effects like environment. It might just be a row of ones if it's just for the intercept. And then the beta is the slopes for that. Um, this is zu. The Z is actually the marker design matrix. And um, the markers are, um, they use 0, 1, 2 coding, where 0 is one of the alleles, often the minor allele. 1 is the um, heterozygote, and 2 is the homozygote. So really assuming a fully additive model and that each allele you know, has this effect of 1. And when you have two alleles, and you have double that effect. So, um, you know, the dominance recessive framework is a deviation from this, from this additivity model. Um, so um, U, 
is actually the random added genetic effects. Um, and by random, we assume it's just drawn from a population and we're estimating the variance. And we estimate it with this really particular um, equa equation where we have the genetic variance times K, and that's a kinship coefficient. Um, and then this ZU, the sum of those, those are the genetic effects contributing to the trait. So I want to talk a little bit about K and why we have a kinship coefficient. And that population structure um, can be a issue that results in um, false po um, positives. Um, some DNA markers just happen to be common in particular populations and that association doesn't tell us anything about this trait. And so it's important to um, account for that. And here is a classic example is this rate of type 2 um, di diabetes among Native Americans located in these um, first nations um, that are located in the or historically located in the Arizona um, area. If you just looked at all the people being sampled, 8% um, of them that had this uh, extremely unmemorable um, haplotype, you know, it's a combination of genotypes, you know, um, had diabetes. And then if they didn't have a haplotype, it was a much higher rate. Well, if you simply pulled off people um, who were um, full heritage Native Amer American, it was actually pretty equal. This haplotype had nothing to do with um, the occurrence of type 2 diabetes. And so central to understanding this is this concept of dandy by descent, and that's just that the probability that similarity in alleles between individuals is, is, is due to inheritance from a common ancestor. And so ways to handle this, so this is an example of um, some cattle breeds in, Scot in Scotland where Roan Gauntlet actually has parentage from Lord R Raglan on both sides of, I believe this is a steer of his family. Um, so um, of course you can use a kinship matrix based on SNP markers, that's how it's almost always used. The pedigree can be used if there's an accurate pedigree, that's almost never the case. Um, often a spectral decomposition is used like principal component anal um, analysis. However, for those luckies where the population is truly randomly mating, they, nothing needs to be done. Um, I don't know when that occurs because it doesn't occur in agricultural crops, that's for certain. So GWAS has its drawbacks. Um, so of course this is, you know, a chromosome. Each of these colors is a chromosome. These are all the markers and this is the p-value from that test. Okay, <laughs> a lot of tests conducted, only a few of them met this threshold. Um, the risk of false positives when you're performing 10,000 or a million tests is so high, you have to do a p-value correction. Um, there's lots of options for that and they're pretty effective. But when you do that, um, it really kills your power and then it makes the ability to detect markers very difficult. And often there's the issue with what's called the winner's curse, where a very strong QTL is detected with an extremely low p-value, and yet it cannot be replicated again for lots of reasons, including, you know, poor control of population structure. Um, and just like in QTL analysis, you know, with linkage-based spurious correlations happen all the time. There's this whole Twitter handle um, at SBOT GWA that they do a, a ridiculous GWAS every day where they, I've seen them try to relate if you broke your arm riding your bike as a kid with some markers. So, you know, just be wary. Um, so detecting QTL and GWAS or linkage based, it's going to be based on just the total amount of genetic variation we're looking at. Um, if there's a substantial amount of environmental variation, what's the size of the population? Is it big enough to really detect these effects? How big is the QTL? Are the markers sufficiently dense? And is the population sufficiently diverse for your trait of interest? Um, okay, so main points. Um, 
think this was actually said the lecture back, but just as a reminder, most of these DNA markers are actually in non-coding regions that, not just non-coding, they really aren't part of the causative chromosomal region. They're outside of it. Um, molecular markers are actually, they actually are phenotypes. Um, um, even though we think of them as genotypes, but they have the same problems where they can be, um, you know, you know, there there can be um, issues with say SNP calling due to assay conditions, um, and then finding really reliable, robust markers that really help us predict traits is difficult. Okay. Ryan, um, we only have a couple of slides I can advance for you if you'd like. I can stop sharing. There we go, there we go. Um, so just kind of, so we talked about some of the genomic um, aspects that we can quantify that relate to phenotypes, um, but that doesn't really get into like the genes themselves. Um, so we can do this through transcriptomics. And so this is an example. Uh, my background is in aquaculture. So I, I use this fish example. Um, so if we're interested in an environmental response or a phenotype, phenotypic res uh, response to an environmental stimulus, um, we can do an experiment, sample the RNA, sequence it, and then assemble the transcripts, the messenger RNA, if you remember that from the central dogma. And then we can look at this back to the genomes uh, by doing differential expression and functional analyses. So we're, we're seeing if these genes have known functions and whether they are being expressed a lot, a little, or being told by the cell not to express um, in, in a particular circumstance. You can think about it like uh, kind of like a thermostat in your house. Um, and so just to wrap up before we go into the breakout rooms, the, some of the use cases for quantifying the gene expression uh, where we would be interested in these mRNA transcript profiles to gain insight into this upregulation or expression or downregulation or suppression of genes in response to a stimulus or a stressor. And we can use this as an extension of the QTL mapping and GWAS for a more robust analysis. So for example, like Julia mentioned, if there's uh, a loci of interest and you design a transcript experiment, you can look to see if the the gene that you found the flanking regions from and your genetic markers is actually going to be expressed in response to an environmental stressor. Um, it's limited by the cDNA. Um, so RNA is single-stranded, as you remember from the central dogma lecture. Um, so we can't directly sequence it. It's pretty new technology. So often we have to turn it into DNA, complementary DNA or cDNA before we can sequence it. Um, and some of these current methods, um, and this is something that Dr. Lyons' lab is working on actively, uh, may miss post-transcriptional modifications. So the RNA sequence may not map back to the gene of interest because something changed in between it being expressed before it gets turned into a protein. Um, and so with that, I will stop sharing and then we can go into the breakout groups. And we can answer some of the questions. Thank you, Nicole, for putting the hack and D up there. Yeah, my final comment is just that um, trait marker associations are really complicated. And unfortunately, knowing the sequence is just not enough. Um, here are the questions for the hack and D. Okay, welcome back. Welcome back to the, the main room after the discussions. I, I hope I hope you all enjoyed your the discussions in your groups. Um, I'm just gonna go over the questions really quickly and then um, we will break and then we'll see you next week. Um, so full disclosure about the questions. Question three is actually 
baiting y'all into next week's lectures. So the things we didn't talk about are going to be talked about next week, like epigenomics, epitranscriptomics, and uh, networks, uh, like biological networks, with different scales from the cell to the environment. Um, so let me just share my screen real quick. I'll turn this into HTML so that we don't have to look at markdown. It's not very pretty to look at. Um, so the first question is, what are some of the pros and cons of sequence information to describe traits? Uh, breakout room one came up with sequencing errors, phenotypes not always at the DNA level, uh, epigenetics, it's a good tie in for next week. Um, you get lots of SNPs, it may not be easy to figure out which SNP is associated with the trait, could not take into account environmental influence, you may not get all of the SNPs or target genes for a quantitative trait. Um, some of the pros, highly useful in many cases, like looking for rare diseases, um, pedigree information for people uh, prior to having children, and it's easy to collect SNPs. I, um, I think they really touched on like the, the accessibility of the technology relative to some of the stuff that we are going to talk about um, in the coming weeks. Um, we're getting closer and closer to like the, the bleeding edge of, of the genotype to phenotype transition. And so we'll start to get more questions than answers as we progress through these weeks. Um, breakout room two enables the understanding of inheritance and genetic control traits. A con is an appropriate reference population may or not be available. So you have to create a population, find a population, make one up, choose it, uh, which has its own caveats, right? That's a, that's a really good con from uh, breakout room two. Uh, breakout room three, the pros, you can see the genotypes via sequencing, you can select for these SNPs when breeding. The cons are the SNPs may be heritable, but the trait may not be. It's a very, very good point. I think somebody brought up in the previous discussion of, of silent genes. Um, so yeah. That's an interesting uh, con. Some SNPs can be located in hard to sequence areas and can therefore be difficult to genotype. Also true. Um, a lot of variation at sequence level may be meaningless. Okay, I personally disagree with that statement, but I can see where I can see where somebody can make an argument for that. Um, meaning is a relativistic term. Breakout room four, um, associate the SNP to phenotype with GWAS. Um, so that's a pro of using that technology, having errors in the sequencing data that skew the description of the trait. Um, and I think, yeah, we didn't really touch on the te sequencing technologies. Um, and that's something that if you're going to go down this, re this road yourself and do these experiments, um, different sequencing platforms are gonna have different errors associated with them. Um, so that's, that's very well documented in the scientific literature. Breakout room five, if you don't know for sure, a sequence matches with a trait, this can be beneficial. Yeah, that is definitely a pro. Like you find some, some interesting and rare loci that you may not have found otherwise. The con is that the sequence may not tell us exactly what the trait will be and multiple sequence for the same, can exist for the same trait. It doesn't tell you the environmental effects on a trait. Uh, breakout room six, I just had a question about a question. Um, breakout room seven, there are pros. We could study inheritance of traits better and the cons is hard to comprehend environment, environmental reaction or interactions. All right, question two, why is the selection of a reference set? Um, somebody had, you know, we didn't talk about exactly what the definition of a reference set was. Um, so I added the text of like a, of like a reference genome or a population of organisms. Um, like if you were interested in a population of North American cattle varieties, you wouldn't start bringing in stuff from the Iberian Peninsula into that analysis necessarily if you're solely focused on North America. Um, so looking at that population wide panel uh, or a reference, an established reference genome. So breakout room one said that they can't map the SNPs without a reference genome. If too divergent, you get a lot of SNPs. If making a SNP chip, you need to know a reference for getting variants. Breakout room two. Can I jump in on the reference genome. Um, you, you can definitely map SNPs without a reference genome and lots of crops don't have them. So you have certain markers that are anchored and that's how you proceed with that. 
Thanks, thanks, Julia. Um, yeah, so that gets back to like this um, breakout room three, a reference that needs to represent the population in order to map the SNP data. Um, reference genome isn't necessarily required, but helpful to select locations of SNPs across the genome in order to generate SNP data sets that are representative of the entire genome. Uh, SNP data sets for different populations in a different SNP chip. If the population that you're working with is too deviant from the reference, then the genotypes that are being called will be inaccurate. And then breakout room five said the reference population has to be all different or the results won't be beneficial. Um, not quite sure. Would somebody from room five like to expand on, on that? If, if not, I can just keep, keep moving through and we can, no? Okay. Um, and then breakout room seven said, if the references aren't clear, you can't interpret the data. Um, and like I said, beginning of this, question three is more of a lead in for next week. Um, and I think everybody kind of nailed the answer. It's a lot of proteins, uh, different messenger RNAs and other RNAs, metabolites. Metabolites is a really big one, especially for networks. Uh, it gives you interactions between organisms. Um, proteins, metabolites, proteins, metabolites, proteins, metabolites. That's just Everybody, everybody got that one correct. So um, thank you everybody for joining us again this week. Um, we can take any questions, comments, concerns. Otherwise we'll see you all next Thursday for epigenomics and epitranscriptomics and biological networks. <laughs>